Now let's discuss the risk management decisions or what we can also refer as risk management strategies that are being followed by corporates in order to manage their risk. The number one strategy that is generally adopted is to avoid risk altogether. So basically this is considered to be one of the most simple strategy because in this strategy you don't have to do anything. So if you think that the commodity market is very risky and it's extremely volatile, the volatility in the commodity market is high and you don't have any direct exposure in the commodities. So you just you are just going in the commodity market to make profit out of it. But since there's a lot of volatility, there's uh, there's some recession in the market, the commodity market has become more volatile. And in order to save the organization from booking losses in the commodity market, you just decide to avoid the risk by not investing in the commodity market. So the first strategy of managing your risk is to avoid the risk altogether. So you don't go to that particular market. Once you don't do that, once you don't invest in that particular market, you won't be booking any losses in that particular market. The second strategy is to retain your risk. So we know that there's a risk when we invest in the equity market. As we discussed earlier, there's a lot of volatility involved. But as a corporate, your target is to achieve a minimum return of 8%. So if you avoid investing in the equity market and you invest in the fixed income market, you may get just 4% profit, but it doesn't lead you to attain your financial objectives. So you know that the, the market is volatile, but for that increased volatility, for that increased risk, you are also getting a higher return. And hence, you decide to retain the risk that comes with the equity market. The number third approach is to mitigate risk. So you know that you have to go into a particular market, you have to lend money, for example, lending money to corporate, you cannot avoid that. For example, if you're a bank and your major business is to lend money to, to the to the corporates, to the SME, to the individuals, you cannot avoid giving loans to, to, these, uh, to these companies. But what you can do is while lending, you can take collateral. So if, there, if you're a bank, let's say bank A, and if you have given $1 million loan to party B, what you can do is you can ask them to submit or to give a collateral or a gold which would be equaling to the amount of loan. So what would happen if this particular party default, if party B does not pay money back to A uh, or the bank, the bank has gold worth, worth $1 million. So in case of default, in case of not getting the money back, the bank will just sell its gold and will recover the money. This approach is known as mitigation, risk mitigation through which you can minimize your risk. The last approach is to transfer the risk. So some, uh, somewhat in some of the cases, uh, avoidance is not a possibility. You cannot retain risk and you can not mitigate it either. So what you do is you transfer your risk to another party. Insurance coverage or taking insurance from an insurance company is an example of transfer risk. So if there is if there is a building which worth ten million dollars and it's in such a such an area where there are possibilities of earthquake. So what would you do? You would take an insurance policy, you would be paying 0.1 million dollars of premium for example and you get covered for this 10 million dollar loss so what you practically did you actually transferred your risk from your own book through this particular premium to the insurance company so this is another way of transferring your risk outsourcing is also considered to be a risk transfer mechanism where you assign the responsibilities that you cannot do to another company. Now let's talk about some of the risk management challenges. 
So the first challenge that we face in risk management implementation is the first one is that economy is too concentrated. So basically, as you know, there are there are different market there there are different players in the market. There are corporates, there are banks, there are regulators, there are insurance companies, and so on, so forth. During 2007 financial crisis, it was discovered that the risk was concentrated among two among that risk was concentrated among few counterparties. Top three or top four of the banks had about 50, more than 50 percent of the total lending portfolio. And despite what sort of risk management do you do at, at an individual level? One event in the risk management, one bankruptcy can lead to another bankruptcy. This is something that we witness with the fall of Lemon Brothers. The all of the market actually got impacted. The second challenge is that preventing financial and accounting fraud is actually very difficult. So risk management has actually evolved over the years. There are a number of regulations, a number of strategies, a number of uh, acts which have been implemented but the fact remains that the risk management has failed to prevent market disruption and accounting fraud at a at a greater level so despite of of Basel 2 uh, there were issues with the with the banking sector we saw a number of frauds uh, a number of accounting frauds for example Existence of derivative financial instruments greatly facilitate the abil ability to assume high level of risk. So basically what you are, you are trying to do, you are creating SPVs, you are investing in the derivative market and you are trying to cover up your losses. You are trying to not represent the actual books, the actual losses that you can book in your financial books and hence preventing the overall risk management and hence preventing the losses from accounting fraud still remains a challenge. The third risk management challenge is the overstatement of financial statements. So as we discussed earlier, the use of derivatives are extremely complex. So there are a number of uh, there are a number of products, there are a number of strategies that can be issued that can be used to manage your risk and while doing so organization actually overstate their financial position so the net asset on the on their balance sheet does not reflect their actual risk and hence if we don't know the actual risk that we are carrying if we are overstating or over and underestimating our risk then no matter how much sophisticated or our risk management processes are an inaccurate information would not allow the policies to be effective and managing all the risk still managing all the risk would still remain a challenge the last challenge is that the risk only get transferred so in the earlier example we talked about insurance where bank actually transferred its risk to, a, to an insurance company but the problem is that the overall economy is the same so in the in the, in the overall economy there are corporates there are insurance companies there are banks there are individuals so you may transfer risk from a bank to an insurance company or from an individual to a corporate or from a bank to a corporate but on an overall level you are only transferring this from one party to another and if there is any issue with one party the other party or, or the system at large would get impacted now let's talk about some of the risk majors which are widely used in managing the risk first let's start discussing with quantitative risk majors so there are a number of quantitative risk models that are being used we earlier talked about the exposure at default probability of default, loss given default model. Uh, it was one of the example of quantitative risk major, majors. It was an example of quantitative risk majors. But another 
model another measure which is widely used is known as var or value at risk the major actually quantify the risk by calculating volatility in the market recalling from earlier slides we mentioned uh, volatility or uncertainty is volatility around mean volatility around mean so using a number of approaches using a number of historical or hypothetical data we actually come up with the volatility in the return series for the financial market to calculate the volatility in our portfolios uh, var is an extremely useful measure for liquid positions by liquid positions we are talking about portfolios like equity market like bond market which can be liquidated on a on a daily basis um, and we are it, it's more relevant under normal market circumstances when we are expecting the market to behave normally and it is generally called calculated for a short period of time but when you talk about uh, illiquid positions when we talk about non normal situations situations like recession situation like uh, like uh, like of fact tales when the market volatility is five times or six times or seven times higher than normal scenarios uh, or, or the positions are illiquid uh, if if we are trying to calculate it for real estate market for a longer period then it would not be that that practical then it would not be representing the actual volatility in the market so value at risk model is actually calculated for number one liquid positions it's calculated for normal market conditions and for a short period of time if if we take a very simple example of how do we calculate or how do we explain a value at risk uh, we can calculate var for for a bank as usd 10 million at a 99% confidence level so it means that based on the model that we have implemented and based on the volatility that we have calculated in number terms in 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 dollar terms the var is 10 million dollars what does it mean it means that there is only 1% chance the the 99% confidence interval shows that there is only 1% chance which means one out of 100 days the loss would be greater than USD 10 million. So for all of the 99 days, the overall loss for, for the bank would remain less than 10 million dollars. So you know that maximum loss that you can have is 10 million dollars and of course then you'll be using it for your risk management strategies. Before we go into detail uh, and discuss the qualitative risk measures, let's discuss some of the challenges in the VAR modeling. So the first challenge is that it is difficult to compare different VAR versions. So in theory, and there's something that we'll, we'll discuss in, in some of the chapter, uh, there are a number of methodologies that can be adopted to calculate value at risk. Historical simulation is one such method. Um, EWM or exponential moving average uh, exponential weighted moving average is one method variance covariance is one method Monte Carlo simulation is one method now the, the problem is that the assumptions for all these models are different the methodology which are adopted for for these models are different and hence it's very difficult to actually compare var calculated under all these methodologies the second challenge is that assumptions are actually simplified but does not meet market dynamics for example the variance covariance approach assumes that the returns are normally distributed while it's actually applicable in most of the situation but there are times when the returns are not normally distributed and in that particular scenario your assumption of normality would be would not be applicable and hence the results that you will generate would not be uh, would not be reliable the last challenge is that VAR gives the largest possible risk over a given confidence level it doesn't cover the quantum of the tail so so in the earlier example we see that we we said that there would be 10 million dollar loss here uh, standing at 99 percent but there is one person that is there in the tail and if it goes it can goes to 15 million to 20 million to 25 million and there's no limit in here so basically what what can tell us that what sort of 
loss that you can have but it it does not go into this jail and it it doesn't talk about the the sort of maximum exposure the sort of maximum loss that can that you can have on your investment as i as i just mentioned economic capital is a very critical uh, concept in risk management economic capital is considered to be the amount that the bank should keep aside to cover your expected loss so uh, so the 10 million dollar that we just discussed earlier can be kept as a capital so there is a bank with the name of abc and they have only 100 million dollar book invested in the financial market and based on all of the methodologies they have implemented uh, they have accounted for all of the portfolios that they have the value at risk model is 10 million dollars so based on their model they are assuming that the maximum loss that they can have is 10 million dollars so what they would do they would just keep 10 million dollar aside as a capital they would not be doing anything with this particular amount it will be invested with the regulator and they know that if there is such a loss they have this money in place and they can just use it to to cover up that loss so economic capital is a, is a very critical concept in risk management uh, it is also referred and it is also managed with the name of capital adequacy ratio in the banking sector now let's discuss qualitative risk measures so as we discussed earlier value at risk model and similar models are used to quantify the risk but in addition to the quantitative risk measures qualitative risk measures are used to further enhance the risk management strategy so the first qualitative risk measure is stress testing stress testing is generally a regulatory exercise it means the central bank in in the jurisdiction actually responsible for for the banks to conduct the stress testing and stress testing results are then generally submitted to the central banks so stress in stress testing portfolios are stressed to see their capacity and buffers stress is applied to only one factor to see its impact for example we can apply a stress to the equity market so we can assume that what would happen to our capital buffers if the equity portfolio falls by 20% in a day it can also be increased to 30% to 50% to be able to see the impact on the capital buffer so if the capital adequacy ratio is 15% in normal scenario we would see that if this particular incident happen if it goes down to 14% to 13% or it remains at you know 14.9% the 14.9% shows that the the this particular event this particular stress would not be creating much of a change in the capital position of the bank these stress tests are generally historical surveyed as well so you may see that what sort of historical events are there and then past trends may continue in the future and assuming that you would be replicating those events in the stress test the other method is scenario analysis which is an extension of a stress test but instead of one particular factor different scenarios are built to see the impact on the capital so both in case of stress testing and scenario analysis our objective is to see the impact on the capital in the scenario analysis we can implement best case and worst case scenario covid-19 pandemic can be an example of scenario analysis where we see where we implement a number of scenarios we may we may see the fall of equity portfolio we may see an impact on financing we may say we may see uh, some impact on the deposit side as well so in the scenario analysis you are amalgamating you are incorporating a number of scenarios in one single scenario and then seeing its impact on the capital adequacy ratio or capital buffers generally scenario analysis are hypothetical measures and hypothetical forecast are are assumed based on risk managers assumption so whatever whatever scenario that you may think can happen can be tested in the scenario analysis and you just don't have to assume historically uh, you just don't have to assume the historical events in the scenario analysis as well